Hello and welcome everybody to another episode of The Shift with Gina. I am here looking at some of these trending news stories and the thing that we just have to talk about today, and this will most likely take up the whole episode, is the the announcement of a guy named Guy Benson, who is apparently a conservative commentator, a contributor for Fox News, who announced that he bought a baby with his, quote, husband. I put that in quotes because he's, quote, gay married. No such thing. But he and his, quote, husband um, bought a baby and welcomed the baby into their home, announced it as if, you know, any other, and announced it as if some father would announce it as if his wife gave birth to their baby, right? And so this is the big thing that everybody is talking about today online because it's brought up a lot of questions about surrogacy, of course. Um, it has brought up a lot of questions of whether people on the right should even be opposed to this in the first place. Is this really the hill that we should die on? Um, and so this is what we're going to talk about today. Before we get into it, don't forget, join The Shift, which is a women's online community. We have weight loss programs in there. We have exclusive interviews in there. We do workouts together every week. Um, the cost to join the group is only two lattes a month. So hop in and join. We are doing a steps challenge in December, and we're starting a 30-day reset in January, which is not only about nutrition and um and exercise is going to be a lot of things in terms of habit and lifestyle and um, and mindset. So we're going to do all that in the new year starting January 2nd. So if you're a woman and you want to join, click the link in my description. If you are a guy and you're listening, if you want to share the news with uh, a sister or your girlfriend or your wife or your mom, we got plenty of moms in my group, um, send the link to them and they can join as well. Okay, Let's get into this. Guy Benson announces by sharing a photo on his, I believe, Instagram or Twitter. I don't know. To be honest, I've never heard of Guy Benson before. He's a contributor for Fox News, so that's probably why I don't I don't ever I don't ever watch Fox News. I don't know really anybody on Fox News. Honestly, the only people I know on Fox News are like Greg Gutfeld and Jesse Waters. Laura Ingram still has her show, right? I'm just I don't know any of the any other show host, and I definitely don't know any contributors. So apparently he's a conservative commentator who's, quote, gay married. Um, and when he announced this news, he's like showing the picture of this baby that, again, he and his husband, I'm, every time I say husband, for those of you who are just listening to the audio, I'm putting it in scare quotes because <laughs> husband, they bought a baby. And so when you look at the comment section, a lot of conservatives, people on the right, are congratulating him. This is awesome news. Let's go. Awesome. Good for you guys. Welcome to the most beautiful part of your life. Your parents now. And conservatives do this all the time. Conservatives do this. This is one of the biggest reasons the right deserves to lose. Conservatives will publicly speak out against things like surrogacy, gay marriage, the T word, you know what I'm talking about? I can't say that word because I'm already nearly banned on here. I'm demonetized and everything here on YouTube. Um, but the T word, the conservatives will speak against these things and talk about how they are bad for society, rightfully so, because they are. But then they'll turn around and they will support People on the right who are doing those very things. A good example is Blair White when it comes to the T issue, right? A lot of people on the right who oppose the T word and what it does to our society, they will support Blair White, invite Blair White on their show, like Blair White's photos, all of that. And the same thing when it comes to things like gay marriage. A great, um, look, I don't, I'm not gonna name names, even though the names have been named many times online. But there are a lot of prominent conservative and Christian podcast hosts, authors, media executives, people from very big conservative media companies that you will know and you may even listen to, who publicly congratulate men marrying each other. And they write congratulations and they... Um, they will send them gifts and they publicly celebrate 
these things that people on the right do because they're on the right, they're on our side. So it's okay when they when they get gay married, it's okay when they buy babies because they're on our side. A really, really famous example of this is when Governor Ron DeSantis sent a gift to Dave Rubin and his husband, David Rubin, for when they bought two babies. Now, having said that, I will add something. I'm not saying that I'm not saying that we should treat these people poorly if we vehemently disagree with the way they live their life and these serious actions of surrogacy or gay marriage, whatever, that we disagree with. I'm not saying that we need to be cruel to them or unkind, but I know one thing for sure, we should not be congratulating them and publicly supporting these acts when we have said many times online in podcasts and speeches that these are the very things from the liberal ideology that are helping to destroy our society. And conservatives do this all the time. That DeSantis and Dave Rubin thing was one of the best examples, but there are so many more examples that you can probably think of right off the top of your head. You can just hop on Twitter and people are constantly sharing examples like this. You know, and they will, even like these Christian conservative podcast hosts who always speak out against gay marriage, they will like like their coworkers' gay married photos and like, congratulations, awesome job. This is what really rubs me the wrong way about the right is that a lot of people, not everyone, but a lot of people on the right just have no values. They don't stand by their values at the end of the day. And even worse than that, well, probably not worse than that, but just as bad is that all of these mainstream conservative podcasters and, and commentators, like they will never sit down and have a conversation with anybody who was even slightly to the right of them, because they know that if they do sit down with them, that person will call them out and ask them, hey, why are you publicly supporting these social issues that are ruining our society when your friends do them? But it's not okay when people on the left do them. And this is what what I can't stand about conservatives today, is they do this all the time. And this Guy Benson thing is another great example. You can just go to Twitter and you'll see all these like conservative people that are like, oh, congratulations, people who have shows and, and books and everything. And I'm like, what are we really doing here, guys? What is happening? So the fact that the right, much of the right, not all the right, the fact that much of the right is now supporting their friends, as long as they're conservative, they can buy babies. It, it's, it's perfectly reflective of how broken this movement is. And it's one of the reasons why we just cannot win anything. It's one of the reasons why, okay, that's not true. It's not like we haven't won anything, but it's one of the reasons why we're just not able to win in bigger ways because we cannot live out our values. We, people will change what they believe and they'll go back on their values if they're friends, if it's their friends who are doing those things. So let's talk a little bit first about why surrogacy is immoral, because this is this is now a big question. Um, it is a point of debate. There are a lot of people who are still asking, even on the right, why are you so upset about surrogacy? What's the big deal? It seems like this child is going to a good home. They have two parents. Um, this child is provided for. So what do you care about the way that the child was brought into the world? So surrogacy and IVF and abortion, they are all actually, it sounds harsh at first, but they are all actually in the same category. And at the heart of it, we oppose all of these things for the same reason. And I'm going to quote Michael Knowles here because he had, I just happened to stumble upon a clip on Twitter today of, I think, maybe his episode from today or yesterday, where he was talking about the immorality of surrogacy. And the way that he articulated it, I think, is is perfect. I couldn't have said it better myself. He said, we oppose all of these things, abortion, IVF, surrogacy, et cetera, because it comes down to this. These things treat human life as if it is a product to be bought and or discarded of. That's really the heart of all of these matters. For example, at abortion, it is it treats human life not as if it's precious and unique and deserves a right to life, but we treat human life as it is, as it is something disposable that can be um, discarded of, that can be killed because for a variety of reasons, maybe the mom just doesn't feel like being a mom. It's her choice. Uh, or maybe even in cases the woman is raped, so then that life deserves to be discarded of. And then you let's go to surrogacy and things like IVF. 
in these situations, the human life, the baby is treated as a commodity, is treated as a product that can be created in a Petri dish, created in any way that we want to create it, can be bought and in some cases can be discarded of. That's one of the biggest moral issues about IVF is that a lot of people, and for those of you who don't really know much about IVF, the reason why there are a lot of, and I'm gonna call them abortions because that's what they are, the reason there are a lot of abortions with IVF is because they try to create as many embryos as possible. So they'll take the egg, there's an egg retrieval from the woman, and there's a sperm retrieval from the male, and in a little Petri dish, they create, quote, an embryo. That in and of itself is a very sterile unnatural way to create human life, especially as Christians, we know that sex is a sacred thing that is meant to be preserved for husband and wife for procreation. That is how God created life and created babies (laughs) to be made. And that's one of the main purposes of marriage. So even just that in and of itself, taking sperm and taking egg and creating this embryo in a Petri dish, sterile and unnatural. But even further than that, they have to try to make as many embryos as possible because it doesn't really have that high of a success rate. So what you'll often see is that couples will have five or six embryos in the freezer. Those are babies. Remember, an embryo has unique DNA. You know whether it's a boy or a girl. That is a unique person in the early stages of life. That's an embryo. Um, those embryos are, are stashed in a freezer and the parents can choose how many of those babies they want to try to implant into the woman's uterus in order to essentially take a gamble and have a child. So I, I know I know quite a few people, whether it's friends or family members who have done IVF. And I'll just give like one example, an anonymous example. This one couple I know, they currently have three sons in their freezer, and um, they they had a child with the first embryo and they have three more, three boys that are waiting in the freezer. I also know a lot of parents who have embryos sitting in the freezer, they don't want to have more of those children, whether it's because the woman's getting to an age where it's not, it's likely not gonna be successful. So for example, one of the main reasons that women do IVF is because they're getting a little bit later in life. They're not able to have children naturally. Um, and so they think it's their best shot to, to, to go the IVF route. And let's say, for example, the woman has her first child via IVF at 36. Okay. Then she gets to 38 or 39 and she's thinking to herself, well, the success rates are much lower when I'm nearing 40 and I have three or four babies in the freezer. I'm not going to want to give birth to all of them. Sometimes they will try to implant two embryos at the same time because, there is a chance that one of them could not survive. And so sometimes it's not, sometimes parents won't even try to implant one at a time because it's just, it's too risky that the child may not survive. So that's a really long-winded way to say IVF often results in abortion because what these parents end up doing is they opt in for the embryos to be destroyed. That is an abortion. That is the intentional ending of a human life. And we have been conditioned to believe that because that human life is in such an early stage, the embryo is, oh, who cares about an embryo? It's nothing. They can't feel pain. You can't see what the child looks like. Who cares if you know if it's a boy or a girl? Just discard of it. It's a very, again, sterile, but there's an even better word for it. it it's it's a very disappointing way to to approach the value of human life. So this is related to what Michael Knowles said. We, we oppose all of these things as conservatives because they treat human life as if they are products to be bought and or discarded of. That's the same thing with surrogacy. In surrogacy, a child is created as if he or she is a product. So a common example, let's start with the the example of a gay couple, right? Because, you know, this is starting to become more common. We saw this with Guy Benson. We saw it with Dave Rubin. Now, for those of you who don't know how this works, let me explain to you how these gay couples, uh, how they approach surrogacy. And this is not necessarily the case for every single one of these couples, but this is common. So they are presented with uh, a folder 
of women to choose an egg from, right? Because for these gay couples, um, notice it's, it's you know, two men, so they need an egg. And so they'll choose which man is gonna give the sperm. So they have a binder of thousands. I know one couple peripherally, like a friend of a friend, uh, these two men, they went through 30,000 different women to try to choose an egg. And in these binders, they have information like the height, they have the photos, they have the IQ, they have uh, where they went to school, medical history, all of that. So if they want their, their child to have blonde hair and blue eyes or dark hair and brown eyes, they have all of these options. So they choose a woman to retrieve an egg from. Now, a woman who is selling her eggs it could be a variety, a different of type of women. So it could be even like a college girl who was selling her eggs for like 10,000 bucks just to make some cash. And so they choose a woman and they pay for an egg retrieval. And then they go through this sort of IVF process where they donate the sperm, the egg and the sperm are used to create an embryo, and then they find a surrogate. So you already have two different women in this process that are being treated as products in and of themselves. We're, we haven't even gotten to the baby yet being treated as a product. We have these women who are donating their bodies so that a guy and his other another guy can buy a baby. And then you have these surrogates, many of whom are not even from this country. They're immigrants. They're trying to make money because you could probably get easily paid thirty to $50,000 to carry a child for somebody else. Do you ever see any rich people carrying kids for poor poor people? No, it's never that way. We always we always see it the other way around. Of course, it's only going to be a woman who is not financially well off, who is probably struggling, who is trying to make some extra cash in any dystopian way possible. So she's going to earn $30,000 to carry some random dude's baby and pop it out and give it away. And so you have this child that is treated like a commodity, and the thing about surrogacy that's so upsetting is that it exclusively focuses on the adult's desires and not the child's needs or the child's rights. Every child deserves the right to his mother and father. Now, we're going to get to the adoption argument because that's a common response I get. So yes, there are, of course, many instances where a child does have a right to his mother and father, but the mother and father are unfit to, to raise the child. But this is a, it's a much different thing than surrogacy. Like I said, we're going to get there. But the child's needs are not considered because what is the most basic need of any infant, of any newborn? His mommy. There is no amount of science or liberal ideology or word salad that can change that. The true nature of any child is he or she needs his mommy. He needs his mother for nourishment, for sustenance, for comfort, for emotional attachment, to grow and develop in a healthy way. So you now have this child that has been passed around like a pet that has been created as if he or she is a designer pet and then has been carted off and handed off to two random men that he has no idea anything about, has no connection to. Yeah, okay, he shares DNA with one of them but he's passed off to these two men. And the only mother that he has ever known, the woman who carried him for nine months, the woman whose smell and voice he knows intimately. This is the thing, when you dehumanize pregnancy, you completely ignore the fact that there is so much intimacy in pregnancy. The intimacy that you experience with your child, that I experienced with my daughter, that I'm experiencing now, I'm, I'm like 16, 17 weeks pregnant now, you... There are no words to describe the intimacy that you feel. Your child knows the sound of your voice. As soon as that child is born, just hearing your voice or, or being close to mommy can stop the child from crying and can comfort the child because there are biological and physiological and spiritual connections between the mother and the child that cannot be explained by science. Thank God. How amazing is that? God has created us to be so complex and, and so perfect. The connection that God created between a mother and her child is so perfect and so pure that science can never describe it and it can never achieve it in any way. So there are ways that a mother and her child are connected that science cannot prove. So ripping away, even if that child is not genetically related to the woman 
who carries that child, there is still a connection there because of the body that they share. And ripping that child away from that mother is, it's a crime. So that, it, in a nutshell, that explains why surrogacy is similar to IVF and abortion because it treats human life as a product, as a commodity, and that is wrong. And we've actually seen a lot of examples recently in Hollywood and the world of celebrities where these famous people have come out and they have admitted that surrogacy was incredibly difficult for them to manage because there was a huge disconnect. So obviously celebrities have been doing surrogacy for a long time because they have the money to do it. And because there are a lot of actresses who don't want to, quote, sacrifice their body. A great example that happened pretty recently was Nick Jonas and his wife, Priyanka Chopra. She didn't want to sacrifice her body. So they they paid a woman to carry their child. And also, let me just add as a little side note, I don't think many women understand or many people understand the health complications that come along with surrogacy. You have to think of it this way, right? If you, we acknowledge that God created women's bodies to carry our own children. And if you think about the the risk there is to implant an embryo into a random body to which they have no connection, to which they have no genetic genetics connection with, right? That that increases the likelihood of some sort of health risks. You, I mean that and that also is proven too. There's plenty of studies on how the the health of a child is at risk, slightly at risk, if you're putting the embryo in a random host. Because again, there are a lot of connections, physiologically and biologically, between mother and child that cannot be even explained by science. So we're doing this sort of Frankenstein thing where we're planting an embryo in a random woman's body and expecting the woman to just accept it. The body will just accept it. A lot of times, a lot of times it doesn't work. A lot of times a woman will miscarry because the body does not recognize the DNA, it may see it as a threat. So in the case of someone like Nick Jonas and his wife, their child was in the ICU for a long time. I don't know exactly what the health complications were, but I think it's safe to say that there is a likelihood, a high likelihood that those health complications with the child arose from the fact that he or she, I forgot the gender of the baby, was, was, was put into a surrogate, a random woman. So you see a lot more of these celebrity examples. Um, probably one of the most prominent ones that has come out recently is Khloe Kardashian. The Kardashians are billionaires. You know, they have more money than pretty much anybody in the world at this point. And so, of course, surrogacy is going to be a popular thing for them because their whole business is about their body and the way that they look. So with Khloe's second child, she hired a surrogate. And I've talked about this in a previous episode. You can go back and watch that one. And she admitted in their reality TV show that it was really difficult for months and months for her to even try to connect with her son because it was just this huge disconnect. Of course, there's a huge disconnect. And she talked about how hurtful it was and how painful it was that she could not connect with her own son in the first months of his life. And Kim Kardashian was listening and she agreed that, yes, you know, in her Valley Girl way, she was like, like, there is like a difference. Like, I think that there is like a difference. Like the baby feels you and like the baby knows who you are when like the baby is like inside of you. And in her Valley Girl way, she was getting to the same point that we are getting to is that, of course, it's different. And then we heard Lance Bass, gay guy from NSYNC. He and his, quote, husband bought a baby. And he said for like the first 10 months of the child, actually, it was twins. For the first 10 months of the twins' life, they weren't even interested in the guys. They were interested in Lance's mother. I wonder why. That's a real mystery to figure out. So many of these celebrity examples are coming out. I feel like there's another one I could think of, but I mean, they're they're all the same. They're all the same because they all prove that surrogacy provides this massive disconnect that is hardest on the child. And you know what really makes me angry as a mom, what really makes my blood boil when I hear all of these celebrities talk about this? The only thing they can focus on is how hard it was for them as an adult. If you think it was that hard for you to connect with that child, how hard do you think it was for that newborn baby who is new to the world, who doesn't know anything about the world, 
how scary and how the world must seem to this child because they don't have their mommy around. You think it's hard for you, Khloe Kardashian? You think it's hard for you, Lance Bass? Yeah, how hard do you think it is for that child? And this is, this is surrogacy. It focuses primarily and exclusively on the adult's desires. I wanna be a baby, I wanna be a mom so bad, so I'm gonna buy a baby. And it doesn't even begin, you don't even begin to ask what the child's needs are. If you think it's so hard for you to connect with the child, imagine how heartbreaking and terrifying it is for this child to be born into the world and handed off to strangers immediately. It makes me mad. It really gets me fired up because I think becoming a mother offers so much clarity on the sacredness of motherhood and how it cannot be replicated no matter how advanced science is, no matter how much money you have, it cannot be replicated. And it is criminal what these couples are doing to babies. It's wrong. The question, is it, diff is it different when a gay couple does it? Very common question that we're getting when we talk about surrogacy and how much we oppose it. Um, oh, you get a lot of these, people think it's a gotcha response. They're like, Oh, so I'm sure you'd be okay with a straight couple does it. Yeah, um, nice try, dude, but we are opposed when anyone does it. Of course, we will admit, though, that we have a more visceral reaction when we see two men holding a baby. The weirdest one is like when Pete Buttigieg and his gay, gay quote, husband, they like sat in the hospital bed. They shared the hospital bed and held, I think they were twins, like, what are you doing in the hospital? Why are you cosplaying as a mom who just gave birth to her children? Like, why are you sitting in the hospital bed? It's so bizarre when they do that. Of course, we have a more visceral reaction to seeing men buy babies. You know why? Because it's normal and natural to look at that situation and be disgusted by it. Because it is much more unnatural to see two men or even two women hold a baby with no mother in sight or no father in sight. Of course, that's weird. This is a natural prejudice that we should have. Prejudice, the word prejudice has become a scary, naughty word. Like we're not allowed to have any prejudice. I talk, uh, you've probably heard me talk before about Edmund Burke, who is considered the father of conservative politics. And he, I think it was a few episodes ago I talked about this. He wrote about the importance of wisdom, discernment, prejudice, and passion and how all of these are more important than reason and logic, and that humans are not ruled by reason and logic. They, they serve a purpose, but human beings are not primarily driven by logic. We are, more, uh, we, we are more driven by, and we are more influenced by our passion, by storytelling, and by prejudice. And prejudice is a good thing, especially if Coming from a Christian perspective, when you have the Holy Spirit, you have this discernment that allows you to see something and acknowledge that it is wrong, even if you cannot articulate it right away. Even if you can't describe exactly what's wrong about that, that is an abomination. You can just feel it in your heart, right? That is a type of prejudice. It's a natural prejudice that we have against things that are evil and immoral. That's a good thing. So when you look at two men holding a baby in a hospital bed that they just bought, of course, you're going to have a more visceral reaction than when you see a man and a woman sitting and posing with a newborn. But it doesn't make it any less immoral when a straight couple when a straight couple does surrogacy. It just it just doesn't. It's the same exact thing. Same thing. And the the argument that people make is well, that mother at least shares, that mother shares the DNA. Both of them share the DNA with the child. Yes, that's true. But again, that child, those, those, both of those people are still strangers to that child because the child grew for nine months and another woman's body knows her voice, knows her smell, knows her touch, knows the gait of her walk, knows everything about her, knows her laugh. And then the children are, hand, the child is handed off to this random couple that, okay, yeah, sure, they genetically are related. So like Khloe Kardashian, she's genetically related to her son, but she had no connection with him. That is a very sterile and unnatural, immoral way to approach life. It treats life as a commodity, as if the child is a pet to be created and passed around between different couples. So no, it's not okay when straight couples do this. And 
you know, it's it's not it's not okay to be guilted into feeling bad about this take. A lot of people will say, oh, so you're against surrogacy. That means what? You think that infertile women don't deserve to have children? That's not what we're saying. No, what we're saying is that we 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 prioritize the child's well-being and wellness over the desires of adults. And just because a couple is struggling with infertility does not automatically mean that they should be able to create a child in a Petri dish, dish and have another woman incubate the child for nine months. It's wrong. It's immoral either way. So common responses to surrogacy. Uh, one response that I saw recently by uh, an account that claims to be conservative. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe they don't. Okay, maybe they're, I, I've seen this account. It's called The Rabbit Hole. So this is what they said in response to the Guy Benson backlash. I assume the women involved consented to being surrogates. If so, what exactly is the issue here? Conservatives need to find better hills to die on so they stop losing. So stupid. Let's get to the first question first. What exactly is the issue if the women consented to it? Do you know how liberal that is? Let me explain to you how deeply liberal and leftist that question is. Because that question relies, it hinges on the idea that morality is based on consent. And consent-based morality is a cancer that has been slowly decaying our society for decades now. And consent-based morality is the foundation of liberalism. As long as they consent to it, as long as two adults consent to it, they can, they should be able to have a quote gay marriage. They should be able to uh, participate in orgies as long as you consent to it. And this is the same argument that's applied to porn and OnlyFans. As long as the woman consents to it, it's totally fine. You shouldn't have a problem with it because they consented to it. Now, let's take that a little bit further and, and see how depraved this can become. Okay, so if we're talking about consent, can a polyamorous four-person four unit raise kids? If a person consents to have sex with an animal and the animal consents, is, that, is bestiality okay if they consent to it? Is it, and this is, and notice this is what they're doing with, with the youth, with children now. A child can consent to it. If a 14-year-old can consent to having sex with a 30-year-old, is that is that appropriate? Is that moral? Consent-based morality is, is, is a cancer and it's the easiest way. It's the slippery slope is what it is. And they they made fun of conservatives many years ago for talking about the slippery slope and we they, we ended up being right. So just because somebody consents to something doesn't make it moral. Just because someone consents to making a child in a Petri dish and carrying the child for nine months and then giving it away like it's a product does not make it okay. And if you are going to make the consent-based argument, where's the consent of the child? <laughs> Did that child consent to, to be taken away from his mommy? No. So that in and of itself breaks down your argument. Another common response I hear is, and this one is really, really stupid. So let me find this tweet that I wrote recently. I was writing about how uh, how immoral surrogacy is. And someone responded and they said, let's see if I can pull it up. Um, ah, would you rather the baby be aborted? That's what somebody asked me. So so you just don't want the child to be born. I thought you were pro-life. I'm not pro-life, I'm anti-abortion. But this is the argument they try to use. Oh, you're against surrogacy, so you'd rather the baby be dead? What? What? Wh why Why are you suddenly bringing up infanticide? Why is, why is abortion even on your mind? Can you please go be unserious elsewhere? Like this is the dumbest response that I think I've seen. In, in response to our our opposition of surrogacy. So you'd rather the baby be dead. No, we want the baby to be with his mommy and daddy. 
The thing about surrogacy is that it creates children exactly for the purpose of giving the child away to somebody else. It's not like a child was born and the only way for the child to live was to be sold to a K couple. No, life is created. There's an, an intentional creation of a life to sell the baby to somebody else. And that is immoral. And this relates to another another common response. So you oppose adoption. I've been talking about that we're gonna get to this for a little while now. We don't oppose adoption because we oppose surrogacy. Of course, the adoption industry right now, or, or whatever you wanna call it, the way that adoption is, is handled in the US right now, the system, the system is the right word, the system needs work. The system definitely needs work. It's not a perfect system. There are a lot of cases where children are given to totally um, inappropriate homes and unprepared couples. But the thing about adoption is that the heart of adoption is that it actually prioritizes the child's well being over anything else. That's what adoption is meant to do. You're removing a child from a tragic situation in which the parents are unfit to raise the, the kid, whether it's because they're drug addicts or they're abusive, or maybe they passed away tragically suddenly. This is not creating suffering for the child to go through so that you're making some adults happy. That's not what adoption is. Adoption is trying to rectify a tragic situation to give the child a better life. So they're not related. You cannot say that someone opposes adoption just because they oppose surrogacy. It's just, it's it's not, it's not true. But the last thing that I wanna, I wanna talk about, we've been going a little bit longer than usual here is infertility. So surrogacy is being promoted as, as a very common solution to infertility, which is why whenever you talk about surrogacy now and how much you oppose it, you're often met with the response, oh, so you don't think infertile women deserve to have children. I want to talk about infertility. The conventional medical system has every incentive to diagnose a woman as infertile. Because the second you are labeled infertile, you turn into a potential money bank for the system. Procedures like IUI, IVF, surrogacy, et cetera, are incredibly lucrative businesses that help medical providers earn an exorbitant amount of money, so much money. And doctors are so quick to tell a woman that she is infertile. You know what the medical definition of infertility is? A woman is trying to, to get pregnant for a year and she's not able to successfully. That's it. That, that's all you have to do to be declared infertile by the medical system. And now we're seeing infertility rates skyrocket higher than ever. And there it's it's scary how fast we're seeing infertility rates rise. But one of the reasons is because doctors are so quick to diagnose women as infertile. So a woman could be trying for a year to get pregnant, but when she goes to the medical doctor, there's no questions about endocrine disruptors, her lifestyle, her diet, um, what kind of medication she's on. So for example, a woman could, maybe she got off the pill and she's been on the birth control pill for 15 years, like many women are. They're put on it at, let's say, 15 years old. So they get off the pill between 30 and 35 and their body has not detoxed from the pill. They're trying to get pregnant for a year and they're not doing it successfully. Instead of asking questions and and being curious about the woman's health and what might be affecting her fertility, she's, bam, automatically declared infertile. And the reason why doctors do this is because, okay, I, I, I wanna be charitable and say that most of these doctors are just in and of themselves sort of victims of the system and they've been trained this way in medical school or whatever, but these doctors are so quick to label you infertile because they, they you can, you can, you're a money bank. You, you are a huge money maker for the system. You go through IVF, that's thousands and thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars. And these doctors will put women through IVF without even trying to fix their lifestyle. What kind of endocrine disruptors are you consuming on a daily basis? What are, are you, are you hormonally imbalanced? Like when's the last time a medical doctor uh, encouraged a woman who was struggling to get pregnant to go get her hormones checked, to try every natural holistic method that she possibly can in order to attempt to heal her for infertility. I've seen, I've seen countless women be told that they are infertile by a medical doctor 
only to turn around and heal their infertility through natural and holistic measures. And then they go on to carry perfectly healthy children. In fact, I know more women who have been declared infertile by the medical system who have gone on to eventually have healthy children than I know women who have been declared infertile and have never been able to have children. Now, I know it's not the case for every woman struggling with infertility. Of course, it's not guaranteed to be the outcome if you go down the natural holistic route, but it is a reality for many women who were previously encouraged to opt in for something like IVF or surrogacy because they were told there's no hope. And with these infertility rates higher than ever before, I think it's worth considering that many of these women could have a much better shot at conceiving if they looked elsewhere for healing. So when we talk about surrogacy, when we talk about IVF, when we talk about infertility, we have to talk about the health of women because the medical system, for the most part, the vast majority, almost all of them, they are not interested in helping women heal from infertility. Infertility in many cases, not necessarily all, not all, but in many cases, it can be healed. It can be improved. You can improve your fertility. The medical system doesn't want you to know that. And that's what's so upsetting and disturbing about the medical system is they want to push you to do things like IVF and surrogacy. And then people like us who oppose surrogacy, we're seen as the bad guys because we don't want infertile women to have children. Of course, we're the only ones who are willing to give solutions so that infertile women can have children naturally. All you want to do is sell them off to the conventional medical system so they can earn some medical provider hundreds of thousands of dollars by egg retrieval and IVF and surrogacy and whatever. So if we're going to talk about surrogacy seriously and infertility seriously, we have to talk about the health of women. I've done episodes. I did a whole episode on infertility probably several months ago at this point. You can listen to it here on YouTube, on audio podcasts, wherever. I went through a lot of the, the most common causes of infertility. And it's it's just devastating that so many women are dealing with this right now and they're they're just they're ignored and they're gaslit by the system. It does not have to be this way for everyone who is struggling to conceive. There are a lot of things that you can learn about your hormones and your cycle. There are a lot of things that you can change about your health and your lifestyle that can significantly improve your chances at conceiving. I did a whole series on hormones and fertility in my women's group, The Shift. You can access all the exclusive content I interviewed in OBGYN, a holistic OBGYN, many natural providers, uh, frequency medicine doctor, functional medicine doctor, a doula, nutritionist, so many different people I interviewed. And it's all in The Shift. So if you want to click the link in the description to join, guys, you can share the link with whoever if there's a woman who needs to hear this. But it's, it, it's not hopeless for every woman out there who is struggling to conceive. I think it's important to know that. Okay, we went for a while today. Um, thanks for sticking around, everybody. We'll be back soon. There is a really viral clip of Sharon Stone talking about how she's hotter at 60 than she was at 20. And there is something really important there that we have to talk about. So we're going to spend the next episode talking about that. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day. We'll talk soon. Thank you for joining and see you next time. Bye. Bye.